First, first question is, can I be heard all right? Is that any better? Is it? Right. No, it seems to be on. That's not right. Good. <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, I, I simply cannot handle technology. Um, I'm a Scotsman. We're famous for our engineering, not me. If I were to try a PowerPoint presentation, uh, I'm afraid it would be a farce, like you remember the lecturer in the third man who ends up running away and being bitten by a parrot. No good. So if you can bear with my voice, here we go. I might start off by saying that, you know, I am a historian and it's been very interesting listening to people talking this morning about economics. It always strikes me that, you know, the sort of economics you get in the later 20th century is really based on the first half of the 20th century, that great slump. And really, it's utterly anomalous, a product of the First World War and so on. The sooner we get back to 1890, the better. Now, I've got, uh, I suppose it is the end of, it is the hard luck story of all lecturers, but I have a huge subject to cover. And I'll do my best with it. The Middle East, the Ottoman Empire, with all the complications that uh, follow therefrom. Uh, Ottoman Empire, Morocco to the Volga at one stage. I don't want to talk about this. I can only indicate one or two main lines. Now, um, let me just sum up the period that I think we should maybe concentrate on. The First World War didn't really break out in 1914. It broke out in 1911. I don't know, those of you who maybe remember the origins of the First World War will maybe remember the Second Moroccan Dispute when the Germans sent a gunboat to Agadir and a Franco-German quarrel resulted. Now, uh, that resulted in the British taking the side of the French. And in the gap, the Italians thought, oh good, time for us to get our bit in the sun. So they invaded uh, Libya, which was then an Ottoman possession, and then went on to occupy the Dodecanese Islands, some of which are just down the road. Uh, and that was Italy, Italy firing the starting gun. Now the Turks didn't have a good time with that war. They didn't have a navy. Uh, and of course it excited the Balkan states to start attacking the Ottoman Empire, so they took the Ottoman Balkans, all except for the area around Edirne. And then the, first, then the First World War comes up, and there's a dimension to that, which is really that the Germans and the Austrians said, the Ottoman Turkey is going to be our Egypt. The position that the British have in Egypt, or if you like, the French in Syria, the Germans would get in Anatolia. And the German presence, the Austrian presence, is all around. Ankara really became capital because the Germans put a railway station in it. And uh, it comes that dimension of rivalry over the Middle East already involving oil brought Russia and Germany for the first time to the great clash. And that's the background. Now the war in the West formally ended in November 1918 but then it went on and it went on with the Turkish nationalist war of independence which was really only ended in the summer of 1923 by the Treaty of Lausanne. So when we talk the First World War, we're really talking 1911 to 1923, after which the world makes its failed effort to get back to what an American president called normalcy, wonderful word, President Harding. Now, uh, what do we make of this, of the attempt by the West to take over the Middle East. Um, the Germans didn't manage it. The Russians had a goal. Uh, the British and French and the Italians step in, create mandates, create, if you like, a Jewish national home. And uh, people like Lord Curzon, the Foreign Secretary, who had been Viceroy of India, when he was asked, what do you think about the British Empire, Your Lordship, replied, we shall be in India as if 
forever, thinking it's going to be a new Roman Empire. Now these people look very foolish indeed, not just by 1947, when they had to scuttle out of India, but even by 1930, it was obvious enough that Iraq hadn't worked. Um, Lawrence of Arabia observed it all, and he said, why is it that we, with an army of 100,000 men, with poison gas and tanks, can't keep the peace in Iraq, where the Turks did it with a, a locally raised army of 14,000 men executing 95 people a year? Question mark. It's a good question, be it said then as now. Now, looking back on it, the thing that I really don't understand is this. Why is it that these people of 1914, Gertrude Bell, Curzon, Lloyd George, they're very well educated, they're very clever, they wrote extremely well, a lot of them, how could they be so wrong? What accounts for this amazing overconfidence with which they lead the West into this adventure in the Middle East? I suppose, although, you know, I um, don't want to harp too much on it, I suppose the same thing would have to be said about the Americans later on, going on to, going into Iraq. Um, I have to say that maybe I was mistaken, but I supported that. All my Turkish friends said, you're quite wrong. This is not a good idea. Um, but at any rate, one, the striking thing is the confidence with which they go in and then suddenly run into a position, into a situation which is to say the least complicated. As I say, I'm not going to condemn because I'd have to condemn my own original misjudgment, which I would do. So we're dealing with a question, first of all, of overconfidence in dealing with the Middle East. Um, now, uh, I might as well tell you a little anecdote about this. In 1915, when the Turks uh, appeared to be very weak, Winston Churchill said, the moment has come to send battleships through the Dardanelles and you know, the Turks will just collapse. After all, they collapsed in the Balkan Wars. They won't fight back. And they landed their army at Gallipoli. Uh, and only two people in the whole of the British army said, this is a mistake. One was an interesting man, Aubrey Herbert, who was the son of the Earl of Carnarvon, who had, was one of these weird linguists. He picked up Persian, Turkish, God knows what. And he said, don't do this. He was the interpreter. He said, if you push the Turks against the wall, they'll fight back. And the other man was another interesting chap, a, a regimental colonel. Um, Doughty Wiley, who uh, had, been, had become a, what was called a military consul in Adana. You know, as the, as the, um, the Ottoman, well really the Armenian question to be frank, as it got internationalized, international observers were placed there to see what was happening. They were called military consuls. And Doughty Wiley was one, a colonel of a decent regiment. And he, um, he lived in Adana and saw what was going on. He could see the problems of the whole Armenian thing. And he ended up sympathizing with the Turks. And when the Balkan Wars break broke out, he resigned his commission and served in the Turkish equivalent of the Red Cross. It's called the Red Crescent. Uh, and they gave him a big medal for it. Now, he rejoined the army, did his patriotic stuff in Gallipoli, but when he was invited to go and land at the Dardanelles, he said, I'm not carrying a gun, I'm not going to kill any Turks. So he carried a swagger stick only, and I'm sorry to say he got shot, poor old Doughty Wiley. They were the only two people in the British Army who said, this is a mistake. Now, um, let me just introduce another little theme, which I think I owe it to uh, myself to mention. You'll be aware of the uh, name Edward Said. Now, uh, before you read Orientalism, have a look at a devastating book by a man called Robert Irwin, which is about the Said question. 
Um, the word orientalist has now become an insult. It means that people look at the Orient, the Near East, with Western eyes and, as it were, adopt an insulting, patronising attitude to it. Now that is an utter and total misuse of the word orientalist. The orientalists are people who, almost by definition, are, uh, love the subject. You cannot take on something as difficult as Arabic or Ottoman Turkish or I think Old Persian without having almost a love of the subject. You'd have to have it. And they don't spend their lives looking at uh, places like this if they automatically dislike it or want to patronize it. It's quite wrong. And the side book is full of holes. Apart from anything else, he neglected the whole of German scholarship, and German scholarship on this subject is bigger than anywhere else. So I want to make my ritual protest against this misuse of the word Orientalist. Now there are Orientalists, and the Orientalists in this Saidian sense are here. They are people who look at their own civilization and say, why are we not the West? These are the Orientalists, not us. And this introduces quite an interesting subject about the background to the First World War and the aftermath. What made Turkey tick? Because we can now ask that question. The Middle East, when it was Ottoman, somehow ticked, as Lawrence noticed of, of um, Iraq. Um, it didn't tick with the West at all. Now, what made the Ottomans tick? And it's a good enough question to uh, begin with. Uh, in the days when uh, Curzon was expressing himself with near contempt on the sub or glorification on the subject of the West, he would say, people would say, the Turks really owed everything to Byzantium. There is a theory of Turkish history associated with a man called Gibbs, American. We knew his stuff, written in 1916, which said that the Turks are the sort of people who can create an empire of the steppe for a couple of generations, then it collapses. If they want to, if they, to, to make a real empire, they had to take the models of Byzantium. And so they're a sort of Byzantium with attitude, if you like. Um, uh, this can really be waved aside. Uh, we can forget about that. There are interesting similarities between the Turks and the, Byz and the late Byzantines. Uh, half the Byzantine aristocracy simply defected to the Turks because they had a state that worked. It's as simple as that. But you can't really argue that it's Byzantium in disguise. Um, it, what you can maybe argue about Turkey is that the Islam of the creative days, by which I mean the 15th century when Constantinople was taken, is an Islam which is much more open uh, wine is drunk at the court, for instance. Uh, the, Otto the Orthodox Church became the biggest landowner in the whole of the empire. Mehmet Fatih, the conqueror, was after all himself three quarters Balkan Christian by origin. And you could argue, I'm not going to be dogmatic, that the Islam which created the Ottomans in the early days, up to Suleiman in the 16th century, is maybe much more flexible, more open. It's at least arguable. And now, the, um, it's possible to argue, and here, you know, here you're stamping on corns. Why did the Ottoman Empire decline? And again, there is, as it were, an Orientalist attitude, which is associated with the Republic of the 1930s, the 1940s, when people would say the Ottoman Empire declined because of Islam. And you take this sort of story. In, in, 14, in 1570, 1583, I think, Murat III, I'm not sure, but around then, there was a, an Ottoman astronomy. You needed it for navigation, and they had a very good navy. And they had telescopes at the top of a tower at Besiktas. Um, the, the clerics didn't like this. The ulema didn't like this partly because it's astrology. And they said, look, you are trying to probe the secrets of God. You mustn't do this. 
And then there was an earthquake. And the ulema said, that's God's punishment for your trying looking at his secrets. So they turfed the telescopes down over the tower, end of Ottoman astronomy. Now you might say, right, Islam, anti-progress. But then you might widen it to take in what generally happened in the Mediterranean at that time. If you take, for instance, the world of counter-reformation counter Spain, it's not entirely dissimilar. I came across a wonderful one. In 1776, Adam Smith publishes. America does its stuff. Uh, there was one faculty left from the University of Salamanca. Um, all the dons were busy doing something else, so they, there was only one question to be answered in Latin, and it read, what language do the angels speak? And that is, no, that is the world of counter-reformation Catholicism in the later 18th century, and it's rather similar to what could be said to be going on with Islam in that period. Now, however you want to argue it, uh, the, there is one strand which is worth picking up now, I think, when we look at present-day Turkish politics. You know, for a long time in Turkey, you were supposed to say that uh, the late Ottoman Empire is just so much historical rubbish. And, you know, there's a, a great line in, in one of the bits of proofs which I remember, which is that these people look on history as a chicken looks at the bits of eggshell from which it was in the late 1920s. And in 19, you might have said, let's just get rid of the whole of this Ottoman junk. All these creepy, corrupt Levantines, all these dead clerics with their silly questions and their unreadable script. Let's emancipate the women. Let's follow the best foreign examples. John Dewey came from America to advise them on education, this kind of thing. Dame Ninette de Valois arrived to tell them all about the ballet. Um, German architects all over the place. It's a heroic period, but they do not want to know about their history. And although Islam wasn't exactly suppressed, it wasn't given any sort of encouragement. You know, if sometimes if you, if, you, um, if you don't give religion what it wants, it claims to be persecuted. I mean, it talks the language of the persecuted in the style of the persecutor, in effect. So you have to be careful about that. And there were limits to the persecution of Islam in the Ataturk time, but they do not want to know about the Ottoman past, and they had thrown out almost all members of the Ottoman dynasty who were languishing abroad, a lot of them. They reformed the language in, in a way which some people would and I'm sure Mustafa Akyol would say that the language reform was brutal and unnecessary. But it still divides the Turks. They've got a literate population. If you go into a bookshop, you will see quite a flourishing publishing industry. And it wouldn't be true of anywhere to the east and south that this would be the case. At any rate, my point is that the Ataturk revolution is something which abolished history. Now, um, it's that, incidentally, which accounts for the survival of all these statues around the place. I'm not terribly hostile to it, because I can see why an educated girl would say, as so many of them do, if that man hadn't lived, I wouldn't have been where I am now with an independent income and a job of my own. It's important. They obviously exaggerate the... Um, the you know, there, there are too many statues of that sort. I don't know what they can do. Some of the quotations are even funny. If um, I, I don't know how many of you here are Turkish, but the best one I ever discovered was uh, in a garage on the way to Cappadocia, where the great man's statue was there, and it read, Türk şoförü en asıl duyguların insanıdır, meaning the Turkish driver is a person of the most exquisite sensitivity of temperament. <laughs> Obviously, we have to get away from this kind of hero worship. Now, what has been interesting about it is the way in which the Turkish Republic, despite everything, 
despite its military coups, despite this, that, the other, uh, it's been a, a success story. And the um, little examples all over the place, Russians die at 60, Turks die at 70. I don't believe the statistics of, uh, you know, I don't believe any statistic in Turkey at all, actually, because uh, <laughs> they've got um, you know, they've got better things to do than to count their statistics. I, mean, I often think that the Italians steal from the state and are dynamic, and, they, and in England the state steals from the people and is stagnant. Now this is a place with a huge black economy, it's going somewhere, little example. There are something like two million refugees here, and that is not true of any other country between Athens and Singapore. I won't go on about that, the point is too obvious. I think to anybody who has seen it, problems all over the place. Um, now, uh, one strange consequence has been that uh, the Ataturk Republic has been eroded. Its um, secular standards, which you know, have resulted in many, many very good things, very good hospitals, not bad schools, all that sort of thing. Um, the secular standards have sort of, you know, ceased somehow to be living. And so you have the phenomenon coming up of uh, political Islam here. Now I don't want to talk too much about what goes on internally. What, uh, what I'm interested in is what the consequences are going to be for the whole area. Because Turkey has the dynamic bit of it to be frank, the one where, you know, makes things, it gets prizes for its F-16s, um, that uh, Turkey is going to be sucked into the um, sort of role that um, it had in the, well, 17th, 18th century when it's got its tensions, it's got its funny relationship with Persia. Uh, I'm afraid to say, uh, you know, we have a Kurdish problem here. Uh, it's not an easy one. There are seven different Kurdish languages. Setting up a Kurdistan is not a simple matter. Maybe the answer to it is going to have to be that the Turks take over northern Iraq, as happened in the days of Selim the Grim. Uh, it means problems for the Turks. Their relationship with Europe has become become complicated. Uh, it's, um, I don't know what on earth can be done about that. Uh, on the economic side, it's very valuable. But on the other side, the Turks are expanding into Russia. It, exports to even to Central Asia are going up at something like 15% per annum. In other words, Turkey's in a very dangerous position at the moment when it might get the idea that it has the right to be the big power in the region. I think this sort of thing's dangerous. Um, I found I have to say that business with Israel the other day just immensely dismaying. Um, you know, I don't know what the answer to the Gaza Strip uh, would be, but I think to use it as a way of building up anti-Israeli sentiment which it's quite easy to do here, we would have to say. Not anti-Jewish, but anti-Israeli. It's quite easy to stir it up. Um, you, allowing that to happen, and then for the Israelis to handle the whole thing so incredibly badly, of course, compounds the, the whole problem. So it looks to me as if we are in, you know, you know when I came to Turkey in 1995, People said, you know, what a strange, eccentric thing to do. I mean, I came here for many reasons, the very first of which was when I arrived at the airport, I saw six policemen straight out of Midnight Express, looking unbelievably grim, great big black moustaches, smoking heavily under a sign marked, strictly no smoking. And I thought, oh, my sort of country. <laughs> No, um, the uh, decision to come here in 1995 now looks a great deal less eccentric. Uh, 
I didn't know what I was letting myself in for, but it's been an extraordinarily interesting time. Now, where we go from here is, I think, going to be complicated. And I'm afraid that, you know, the Ottoman Empire got torn apart looking at Persia one minute, looking at Vienna the next, having to deal with Morocco one minute and the Volga the next. Uh, worried again what sort of Islam it, uh, it, uh, it, it has, what its attitude's going to be to education of women, all this kind of thing, until at the end they say, oh please West, can we copy you? Which is quite the wrong thing because this country has got strength of its own. Now, I think I've probably um, covered enough of the initial themes of um, that I wanted to talk about, so I can.